Cricket Laugh Stories with Minio Kagram. Again, we're joined by Adrian McKinman, cricket psychologist. We are in session number two. This is a four part series. If you haven't checked out session one, it was all about confidence. We'll link it up in the card above and we'll put it in the playlist, etc. But this one is all about fear. So, Adrian, what is fear? Explain it to us. It's uh, just an emotion that we have when we perceive that we are losing some of our security. It's a healthy emotion at times. It's not abnormal. And we should not see ourselves as weak when we say that we are scared. It, it's a situation where we, when we, we, are, we learn fear. I'll give you an example. When, you, when you're a baby, you don't fear height. But as you get to, and I'm not a developmental psychologist, so don't, <laughs> I don't know the exact month, but roughly when you get to about nine months of age, you start to develop a degree of fear which is advantageous to you. As you start, cr start crawling and crawling and crawling, you might be crawling on a table. Next thing you know, you get to the edge. And unless you stop yourself, well, you can do yourself some harm. No different as an adult. If a tsunami is coming your way, or if a drunk driver is coming your way, you actually want to have a degree of fear for a short period of time so that it causes you to act Get, go to high ground in the case of the tsunami or move out the way in the case of the drunk driver. So we sometimes view people who are scared as weak, but the reality is no, it's actually a good thing. And probably the only time that anybody has absolutely zero fear ever, that they never are scared, is when people have they've actually got a, um, a biological problem with part of their brain. So is it exaggerated more in, say, certain situations? Would that be fair to say? And if we bring it back to cricket, say a batsman's just waiting to go out to bat, is that that moment, that, that kind of specific exaggerated moment just before they're about to walk out or as they're waiting for them, if they're the next man in, would that be fair to say? Well, if we are non-cricketer, there's a good chance that if I ask you what, what causes you to be scared, you'll say things like um, doing speeches, uh, seen a snake, seen a horror movie, becoming unemployed. And if you ask cricketers, exactly as you say, just as they're about to go out and for the first, you know, 20 odd balls when batting and for the first few balls when they're bowling, they, they tend to have increased heart rate, et cetera, et cetera. Doesn't need to be that way, but that, that is the way that we tend to be. We tend to develop a fear of things like snakes, where we don't tend to fear things like um, a pretty flower. So when you talk about fear and stress, are they one and the same thing or not? Ah, now we're talking. Uh, okay. And what I'm about to say is going to surprise some of your listeners. There's no such thing as stress. All right? Now, that is something that is a little hard to swallow initially when you first hear it because everybody talks about it as if there is a thing. I'm sure your friends talk about stress once in a while. Your family members talk about stress once in a while. Your colleagues. Um, if you look at the media, go to Jamaica on the other side of the planet, go to the Gleaner magazine and they, the news, newspaper, they'll talk about stress. Now get on, get on a plane, go to Zimbabwe and have a look at their newspaper. They talk about stress. Go to South Africa. Every week, Time magazine, fairly respectable magazine, they talk about stress. So everywhere you look, we see the thing stress. And yet we have been socialized into believing in the word stress when it's really just a simple basic emotion that everybody has experienced. Fear. Anytime you say you're stressed out, you are not stressed out. You are simply scared. So let me give you an example, right? At the moment, some of your audience are thinking this, this, is, this idiot doesn't know what he's talking about. So let me give you an example. You're in a car and you're driving to a very important meeting. So it might be, let's um, take something extreme. You're off to see the president or prime minister of your country. So you've decided to get to the meeting three hours ahead of time so that there is no way you're not going to make it on time. 
you're driving along and everything's fine and you're nice and relaxed and you're, you're really looking forward to going to see the, the president or the prime minister. But then the traffic becomes a problem. There's an accident up front and you can't do a U-turn, you can't get out and you're looking at your watch and you're looking at your watch. And you're looking at your watch and you're looking at your watch and your heart rate goes up, your breathing goes up. And what's happening? You are not stressed. You are scared. You are scared of the ramifications of what's going to happen if you don't make it to the meeting on time. Anytime you say you're stressed, ask yourself, do you perceive you are in control? And secondly, do you think the future will be better? And if you say the future is going to get worse and I am not in control, well, then there's a, a good possibility you might use the word like stress, but it's not stress, it's fear. You are scared that the future is going to get worse and that you're not in control. So there is no such thing as stress. It is purely a perception that I'm not in control and things are going to get worse. And then does fear, would it be fair to say, um, it affects your clarity of thought? And then, if we ah. bring, and then if we bring it back to cricket again, Mark Gramprakash, ex-England test batsman, he was very open about it when he, you know, in a, in a UK broadcast uh, Sky Sports documentary, he talked about um, how perhaps it's perceived that he didn't have as good a test career as his talents perhaps you know people kind of expected him to and he talked a lot about being kind of crippled with nerves talking about external factors people watching him the the pressure of playing for England and no one really actually having a one-on-one -on -one discussion with him at the first at the beginning of his test career then mm -hmm. when he at the back end of back end of his career when he got a 60 and 150 away in uh, West Indies he didn't mention talking to a sports psychologist. And again, this is a two part question. He didn't go in depth about what they talked about. But if you were the sports psychologist talking to Mark Ramprakash, what would you have thought? Uh, what would you have said to him? And what do you think was said to him that led to him going from a string of low scores and not really fulfilling his talent to scoring the runs? Well, I can't read people's minds, buddy. So I can't tell you what was said. But the first part of the question I can tell you. The, the, re the reality is what you'll find, apart from those at the very top, right, your Verrick Coley's, your Donies, etc., that almost all other cricketers do not perform at their best, especially at the start of their career. They could do so much better if they trained with people like myself. And if you ask, I think we actually talked about this last time, that the vast majority of people will say, that once you've got to a certain level and you've played a certain number of international matches, all the training in the nets and gym isn't going to change anything. It's what's going on in your head on the day and last few days private. Now, you mentioned clarity of thought. And as soon as you said that, the first thing that came to my mind is Virat Kohli. He has talked about having a clarity of, of thought. And so one of the things that you want to do is not be scared. You want to remove all fear. So you want to learn a whole lot of techniques to make your mental thinking more effectively so that you can have huge confidence and this clarity of thought. So I, I don't know what that particular sports psychologist did with that particular cricketer. But what I can tell you is one of the most effective things I would do is if I was working with him or anybody for that matter in cricket, is you want to be focusing on clarity of thought, relaxation slash calmness, positively slash confidence, mental toughness, hardiness, those sorts of things, and ignore fear. Don't even think about it and just try and get yourself into a state where you go out to perform and you're not even, you're not even thinking too much about what you have to do. You just go out there and make it happen. And then can fear be controlled? And then again, if we take another specific cricket example, look at the Ashes series, which recently, the most recent Ashes series that took place. And Joffre Archer's coming in, bowling 95 miles an hour and hits Steve Smith on the neck. And he's out of the test match with concussion. And he's out of the following test. And the follow-up questions he was getting in the press was, are you going to be fearful of Joffre? And Steve Smith's response was, oh, he's never got me out. Now, whether that was just <laughs> him to say in the press, 
or what was he thinking in his head? Can you kind of, you know, that's one example, but can, can fear be controlled? What do you think, you know, if you were speaking to Stephen Smith and facing Joffre Archer, that first ball after being hit, well, what would you say to him? Well, if, if fear cannot be controlled, I don't have a job. There's no point having a sports psychologist. So the answer to your question is a simple yes, absolutely, without a question of a doubt. And one of the things you'll actually find is if you, I'll give an example, the, I won't say which team, but the captain of one of the, the top 10 teams on the planet, right? He, he said to me that of all the things I taught him, the most useful thing I ever taught him was how there is no such thing as stress. It is purely fear. Now, the interesting thing about him was that he was really doing well in life. He was relatively young. His personal life was going really well and his cricket life was going really well. So he was in a relaxed, clear frame of mind to hear what I'm saying. And then when he thought about it for a while, I said, yeah, that makes sense. He could understand what was going on every time he says that he's stressed. It's really just being fear, fearful of the, the future and the ramifications. So yes, you most certainly can control your fear. And then are there different strains of fear? So for example, does is there like, you know, given, given like different circumstances, is there fear of getting out versus different fear of letting your family and friends down? Or is it all yeah. in just all one? Fear is fear. Your, your brain can't tell the difference between if you're scared of, go, of letting your family down versus you're scared of letting fans down, let, let alone um, fear of um, getting out. What your brain does is it stimuli come its way and the brain determines is there a threat or not. If the brain says, no, nah, there's no threat, there's no problem, nothing happens. But if your brain determines there is a threat, you now kick in the fear response. And it doesn't matter if you were worried about letting fans down, letting your family down, getting out, etc. It's the same thing. You, you kick in the fear response, your heart rate goes up, your breathing goes up, and a whole lot of other things go up, including secreting cortisol, etc., etc., etc. So no, it doesn't really matter what was the situation. And I guess that's that's something that we should really just emphasize is situations don't make you scared situations don't make you stressed as people would say it's your perception of the situation if you do not perceive the situation as stressful you will not call it stressful but if you perceive it as stressful you will even though there's no such thing as stress it's purely fear so said another way if you're in an environment and it may be going to jump out of a plane and with a parachute on if you perceive that as scary well then you're scared but if you do not perceive that exact same thing, it's not scary. Give you another non-cricket one, and then I'll give you a cricket one about a guy called Ewan Chatfield. If I forget, just remind me about Ewan. Ice cream. Do you like strawberry ice cream? I do indeed, yes. Hey, okay, cool. You like it, I don't. So if we are both asked to eat some strawberry ice cream and we're both given some strawberry ice cream, you will perceive it as a pleasant, enjoyable experience where I would potentially now perceive it the same thing as a negative experience. So now let's take you and Chatfield. I had the pleasure of actually um, learning cricket from Ewan when I was, I don't know, four or five years of age. I was tiny. And Ewan is probably the worst international cricketer in terms of a batsman that there has ever been. Ewan was absolutely petrified. He was a fast bowler. Uh, well, a medium fast bowler, I guess. Played for New Zealand for many years. But when it went to batting, he was petrified. And sadly, one time he actually got hit in the head by Dennis, um, Dennis Lever. And he was actually, his heart stopped. And what happened was it was on the very last day of a five-day test match. And they didn't want to do, this is a long time ago. This is about the 70s, I guess. And they didn't want to do CPR in front of the crowd, not that there was many people. And there was no doctor there because they only had one wicket left and they, they knew Ewan wasn't going to last long. So the physiotherapist for England actually went out to the field to help him. They brought him off and then they tried to resuscitate him and thankfully they brought him back to life. But after that, it took him a good six months or so before he really got back into playing again. And in those days, there were no such thing as cricket psychologists. And so, you know, he struggled to be able to bat. And the, one of the things that was really interesting is before he started playing cricket again, he actually played a football match. 
and it had been raining and the the football was so heavy that when the ball would come through the air, he didn't want to hit it because he was worried because it was so heavy, etc. But, you know, obviously he he had thoughts of worrying about hitting the ball when he had been hit by a cricket ball six months earlier. So there are things you can do. There are many things that you can do if something like that has happened, working with somebody like me to learn to be able to overcome your negative thoughts and move on and get on with life. It's no different with my Kung Fu background. Not every single time at training are you going to be ideal. Sometimes you get hit in the face. You need to slow down, process, okay, try not to do that next time and be positive and just get back on. Same thing in cricket. And then can you use fear to your advantage? You hear players talk about, um, not only in cricket, just various sports, they say they like a bit of butterflies in their belly before they go out. A few players say that. Or, and if we bring it back to cricket, say a high ball goes in the air and they're standing under it. Is there something that that fear of dropping it uh, might focus the mind or is that just a, a perception which is wrong? Uh, the, the reality is you don't want to be focusing on fear. The last thing you want to be doing is focusing on fear. And so, no, you, you, and you don't want to be increasing your fear. And you don't also want to be, if you're scared, trying to use it to your advantage. What you want to do is just get rid of it. So we talked about last time about things like thought stoppage, that you can use two, three second technique to stop you. If you're thinking negative, get rid of it. It doesn't help you. And likewise, we talked about last time how when you perform at your best, you're not thinking. If you are, it's, it's all positive. And you, you, what you really do is you just tend to get into a flow experience. You're not thinking about time. You're not thinking about yourself. Just things happen and happen effortlessly. And so it's all about creating routines that we like we talked about last time. The more that you can just go in there without even thinking and you just make it happen. You're so confident. So you, you, you really don't want to be thinking in any negative way whatsoever. And if it does, You've got to try and get rid of that as quick as possible and then move on. Well, Adrian, brilliant, fantastic discussion on this subject. Remember, guys, this is episode two of four. Stay on the playlist to see all the episodes. Episode three will all be about mental toughness. And Adrian and I will see you in the next one.